Hey everyone, um, I think we're gonna get started now. Um, so I am happy to welcome Gil Seagull here. We've been trying to get him here for a seminar for a while, but he's been off in one country or another. So we're happy to finally have him here and we're excited to hear what he has to say about some policy issues surrounding um, the rapidly advancing genetics and genomics technologies. So now I'll hand it off to him. <laughs> Okay, so again, thanks for having me. Um, I come from the law school, and but by profession, I am a, sur a surgeon, a doctor, and I'm playing on, well, playing is that's not a good verb, but I'm living my life in both arenas, the legal, ethical one on one hand, and the medical, scientific one on the other hand. So this intersection provides a lot of opportunities to think hard about issues that are emerging and how to deal with them. Um, in this lecture, uh, or this presentation today, I will try to focus more on hands-on issue and not theoretical work um, for two reasons. I understand that most of you are practical people, engineers, chemistry, so I'm gonna bother you with the mumbo-jumbo of lawyers and ethicists. It's gonna be more hands-on. And secondly, because a big chunk of my life is devoted to real-time issues because I serve on national, international committees that actually don't sit and, mm, that's a hard question. Actually, we need to call the shots. What should be the rule? What should regulations say, all right? And I'm saying it because if you do a search around the globe, you'll see that many countries have various and nuanced way to approach issues. You can have, think it, think it as a spectrum. On the one side, do whatever you want. We will not interfere with scientific freedom, with researchers' interests, uh, free expression, and science, and, and other issues is guarded. So that's one way. The other will be very stringent, very strong, very powerful regulation that actually will take care of whatever interests we identify, but will have a toll that is tied to that kind of regulation. And in between, you have all those Yes, we can say a few things on that. It's okay to, to, to do this. It's not okay to do that. So we have this mixed uh, uh, opportunity if you want to move forward, but there is still someone looking behind your shoulder. So regulation, policy making, all those issues are really the way that other people, not the professional itself, are looking and reviewing your activities. That's, that's the notion. So policy making means, okay, you want to do this. So you can tell us as a scientist what is possible. We will tell you what is permissible. So that's one aspect to look at my things I'd like to discuss with you. The second issue pertains to who should call the shots. Should that be the profession itself? Should you rely on auto regulation? Or no, we can't trust these guys. Let's have someone outside it. And those, again, those, there'll be a price to have someone from outside the field deciding right from wrong. And just as I'm talking, think about the examples that you know. 
and how do they play out? And does it make sense or not? So who calls a shot? It can be an individual's qualification. It can be, is it a governmental issue? Is it a city? I mean, let's give you one example. You walk in, you know, Boston is known for its medical facilities. You can walk on Huntington Avenue and have five different hospitals. End of life decisions are not treated by one size fit all. You can walk through three different hospitals and DNR protocols might be different from one hospital to the other. Does it make sense? Is it an issue that should be left to the hospital, to the city, to the state, to the federal system? So these are the who calls the shot. That's an important issue, of course. And the third issue that I'd like to discuss is the paradigm. How do you approach the issue? Should you strive for a thorough understanding of the issues? Or actually should you say, you know, we're going to do it as an ad hoc resolution. We will discuss each case by its merits and not strive to have an all-encompassing solution. I'm saying it because sometimes people look for consistencies. They want to say, okay, what's, what's behind? What is he after? So this will be the opening of my, of my, of my talk. And from now on, it's going to be an open discussion. I'm going to show a few things to you and you will decide whether you want to talk about it more or not. So my today's talk is going to be genetics and genomics. Like I said, I deal with the entire area of healthcare and uh, public health, stuff like that. So you can stop me if things uh, are interesting to you. Um, but the, on topic of genetics and genomics, and I don't think, well, I, and you do know the difference between genetics and genomics, right? Genetics is reading the letters. Genomic is the larger picture, epigenetics, trans, uh, uh, changes on the, on the genes, um, interaction between environments and the gene, and stuff like that. So that's the genomic, that's a larger picture. So in modern aspects of genetic and genomics, these are the issues that we as policymakers need to attack. So issues that relates to research. How do you advance research in genetics? Are all areas of genetic research acceptable? I mean, finding the gene for BRCA, breast cancer, finding the gene for being gay, is that a word, it's acceptable research? Finding the gene for risk taking, is that acceptable? As I'm showing you these examples, you understand that behind the supposedly scientific questions, you will have social, strong sometimes implication of those supposedly scientific questions. So if I'm looking for the risk aversion or risk seeker, behavior, and that's something that we will accept as a permissible avenue of research. And if you do, what we do with the results? Should we throw out the army pilots just because they have the risk-taking genes? Stress handling, PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome. Should I screen for those genes before I take people to medical school, be a soldier? Well, if I do that, what will that pertain to the futures of individuals? So again, you have a scientific path, which makes completely sense. But going through the process and making that workable, that's where you hit the challenges. And that, then the question is, do we need policy making for those issues? So again, I want you to think you'll be, as you go through your roles in life, you, you'll be meeting junctions where Someone else is going to scrutinize your purposes, your work, your protocols, your, your inventions, your, your innovation. Well, do we want it or not? I'll give you one example. Again, we'll get to it later on. But assuming that I'll be able to come with a protocol, that I'll be <clears throat> giving individuals a shampoo, that if they use a shampoo before intercourse, they can influence the embryo's gender or sex. You want a boy, you take a pink shampoo. You want a girl, you take a blue shampoo before the intercourse. And that's going to be my research and get whatever ingredients you're going to find inside. No, it can say, well, that's great. And I can influence the gender or the sex of the embryo. Well, of course, there are major diseases that are sex related, I mean, hemophilia, for, for one example. So in those families, you'd rather have one sex over the other. 
ADD. That's more prevalent in boys than in girls. Okay, so let's have more girls in those families where they have attention deficit syndrome. Well, but I'm just, I just came here to do the research. No, but choosing male from female has vast social implications. So is that research protocol acceptable or not? So that's, that, these are the kind of questions that people with good innovation, good ideas will have to pass the obstacle of someone else scrutinizing the job. So the research is, is one thing. So are all genetic research acceptable? In this country, we have suffered dramatically because of discrimination based on race. But should we or not allow research that is race tailored? I mean, clearly, if I would be able to define race by genes, then suddenly racism receives a legitimate scientific uh, approval or authorization. But nevertheless, some diseases are more prevalent in, other, in one race over the other. So the African-American, they have a specific, unique type of diabetes mellitus, of, di of, of, the, of diabetes. So if I can design a drug that is race-tailored, well, that, I don't have to give them all the drugs. I can give them the right drug based on their race. Whoa. Are we resurrecting the race based on genetics? See, that's so... These are the issues that, that research, supposedly clean, sterile research, can bring about. Clinical. So the use of genetics in clinics, in the clinical world of doctors, is, of course, important. Now, you would think that genetics, yeah, it's about reproductive choices, but it's not. It really goes way beyond that, and I'll show you some examples later on. But clearly, it's reproduction is important. That is the reason you try to move from chance to choice. This is a fine example. I don't want to have a random hybridation of my genes with my wife's genes. I want to control that. I want to take away bad genes. I want to enhance the right genes. I want my son to be quarterback for the Patriots. So I'm going to get the right genes with big muscles, smart brain, fast traction, whatever. I want to influence that. Think about controlling for, gene, for genes in the pre-industrial, the early industrial era. What will be the chances of looking for someone like Bill Gates? Weak, glasses, smart guy. That one with sturdy, big, strong fellows, right? So when you have those abilities to influence and you choose, you are influencing not just scientific issues, but like I said, the larger scale. Genetics has moved and it's not a <coughs> sitting duck. It's really moving and creating new and new issues. And I would like to show you that. For example, going through life. Right now we can discuss food allergies, reactions to medication, side effects to them. Famous example is Coumadin. It's a warfarin, it's an anti-clotting medication. Some people have an awful reaction to it. We can test for that reaction and actually avoid the side effect of that. Problem with that, it's expensive. So you're gonna wait for the trial and error or do it or screen all your patients with, do they have the, the susceptibility to that specific gene or not? Why am I saying that's a policy decision? Because so many patients are getting this medication, so much money will be spent on finding out, are you do you have that gene or not? And that's money that can be allocated elsewhere. So do we condition medication on doing genetic testing? Uh, reacting to medication is a big deal. Uh, um, I'm sure you heard uh, Steve Jobs died from pancreas cancer, pancreatic cancer. He was holding on for far than he was expected. Usually the life expectancy is between three to six months. He held that for two and a half years. Part of the reason for that was that his, he didn't want it at the beginning, but I had to convince him and, and his tumor cells were tested individually to see which kind of chemotherapy will actually work. Because right now when you have a patient with cancer, you just give him the medication and you have a 30% reaction. So 70% of patients were giving medication, chemotherapy, that not, not going to have any effect, and as you know very well, we have a lot of side effects. So it would be so much better if you can tailor your medication to the specific part of the gene. Again, expensive elaborative problem. So from a policy-making perspective, wait a second, we all signed up for medical insurance. Should the insurance cover these kinds of very expensive pre-treatment uh, evaluation? And if it does, what's going to happen to our premiums? 
for everybody, not just for the patients. So that's a policy making decision. Do I want, do I, am I, will I demand insurance company to reimburse patient for these testing that would do them very good, but again, for the, for the, on the large scale, that could be very, very expensive. A huge issue with genetics and policy making and genomics is screening programs. Screening is a powerful world, world, world. I will go through and I'll test all newborns. Do you think we should test all newborns? Don't answer me, you do. Every newborn is hurt, you take blood from his heel and they're screening for diseases today. All of them. You are all on file, by the way, if you didn't know that. Your dry blood spot are kept for validity purposes. And later on, for example, in Michigan, they keep them for a huge bio bank. What's a bio bank? They, it's a huge repository of biological samples that they can later on use to testing. You're not happy with that. It's, it's scary, right? Yeah, well, I got to tell you, I, I, um, we see that a lot. In Texas, a judge ordered 10 million samples to be destroyed. And scientists, some of them committed suicide. That was a huge asset for the scientific world. Now, you're concerned without telling me as, wow, the government has access to my data. Not, well, not you, but just generally, the objection will be, wow. But you see, that's exactly where policymaking steps in. So, okay, tell me your concerns. May we address them? GINA, Genetic Non-Discrimination Act, was exactly turned into a federal bill because of those fears, because people were refraining from being tested because, God forbid, my information leaks. Someone can access to it, my employer, my insurer. So that's why we have GINA to protect us you from. Now, clearly, do we all want to go to CVS or Walls Green and find a new medication for my ailment? Answers, of course I want to. Well, I'll reveal to you a secret, top secret. You cannot get to a new medication if you don't do the research. And if you don't, you can't do the research if you don't have those assets at hand. So you have the benefit, there is a cost. So it's so a psychological cost of me being on file. Okay, that's exactly where policy making steps into the picture. What will be the limits? Who's gonna have access? Is it gonna be completely anonymized, for example? There's no way to go back to identity of the individual. That will be taking care of some of the concerns. You lose on this scientific front because you can no longer trace the patient, so you cannot follow them through, because you understand that if I have a patient's DNA with me, day one, and I follow him throughout 20 years now, if I can link that genetic sample to his life happenings, I can do a retrospective analysis and find the connection between genes, environment, lifestyle, and more. If I says, no, 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 we're so afraid, do it anonymized, then I lose the traceability issue. So, so I, I suffer on the validity and scientific aspect just because we have social calms. Okay, that's a decision to make. I don't, I'm not being judgmental here, just flashing out what are we losing and what are we gaining by the various options. Now, I would say a word about genetic screening. Why are we so annoyed with that? And that's, again, it's a, such a strong policy making issue because we have a horrendous history powerful powers using information to do really, really bad things. I mean, the prime example is, of course, you would say, that people would say the Nazi movement. Of course, that's easy. But actually, Nazis didn't invent eugenics. No, it came from England, West Europe, and the United States. 30,000 Americans were forcibly sterilized in this country before 1940 because they had unfitted genes. That wasn't in the camp. Nazi concentration camp that was in this country. All right, so eugenics, meaning I'm, I'm going to harness the powers of genetics in the name of a social goal. That scares a lot of people, and for good reason. All right. So when I, the minute I invoke the word genetic screening, which means Someone big, someone powerful, the state, the government is going to use genetic powers to screen us. We don't like that at all. All right, so that's where the problem 
that's our uneasiness comes into mind. And we can talk about it a bit, bit more. Of course, you can, then you can have subtypes of screening. So newborn screening, every country in the world is engaged in newborn screening, every single country. The rationale for that is that we need to provide the newborn uh, with a remedy to those actionable diseases. So for example, if he has hypothyroidism, which is found by the, this blood test, you can save him from being having clinic, having a, a, a medical condition that causes men, severe mental retardation. So we don't know who's going to have it. So you screen the entire population to find those children. So that's a fine vindication, no question. Today we do we screen not only for hypothyroidism, but we screen for forty nine diseases. So again, the early identification supposedly is something that is very important. I'm saying supposedly because sometimes we still, within the 49 diseases we screen for, only a part of them are actionable. Only part of them. So you screen for a disease, you label the child with something that right now there's not much to do about it. But of course, informing patients that will inform their reproductive decisions. So it's not just for the child's sake, it's for the family's sake. But then the question is, who is my patient? Is it the child? Is it the family? Who is my patient here? What's, who do I own a relationship? Own, do I own responsibility? All right? I'm just fashioning out those things. We can, of course, discuss in more details later on. So you have the newborn screening, but then you have other screens as possible. Health insurance. I bet that most insurers would say, mm, I'd like to have only the healthy guys in my plan. It's a good, it's a good deal. Well, let's, let's do genetic screening for that. Let's screen out the bad genes people. All right? So... That's a possibility. That's why, again, GINA, the Genetic Inform Information Non-Discrimination Act says that is complete, that practice is completely forbidden. They cannot do that anymore. So you had the fear, and then the policymaking came with its reaction. And by the way, GINA was later on ratified in every single state with a similar local piece of legislation on that. Employment, the same thing. I, would, I, I just want to have the healthy people on my team. I want any secrets. So let's screen out all the... Huntington's people and the BRCA people. So we're going to ban that. Well, the problem with the overall re resolution of banning screening in employment is that actually you will cause patients or employees harm. Think about the following example. If you have uh, teleangiectasia, it's a, it's, a, it's a genetic condition that makes you prone to skin cancer. Now, if I would know that as an employer, I wouldn't send you to the cotton fields, I would send you to the office fields and do work away from the sun. So would the patient, would the, our employee be harmed by me knowing and then putting him in the, in the placement that fits his genetic uh, condition? That's a, that's a fine cause. But nevertheless, the fears of harming so many other people outweigh the discussion to a complete ban. So, like I said, complete ban, do whatever you want. Maybe there should be a middle position that in, right, in the proper circumstances, when there'll be a committee that can ver verify the reason for the application for the screening for this test and placement decision, maybe that's a better decision. All right? So here's a fine example of policy making and rule making that is trying to get a, to, to take away the fears and handle and not look away from those qualms, but try to come with a fruitful win-win a a resolution. Screen for the military, we mentioned that. Genetics and lifestyle, all these are major issues. And this slide, what it really tells you, that policy making and genetics is actually so wide-ranging. It's really, there's so many, actually, whatever they tell you in, in, in your in studies, nothing is more dramatic and interesting than genetics and the law. I'm telling you right now, it's like, it's like the most, it's moving all the time. Completely, I'm completely unbiased here, but it's moving all the time. So you gotta come up, if you're into the policy making, this is where you really uh, uh, need to be very uh, uh, on top of things. So the goal today for me, and I'm gonna try to use my example, is what's the paradigm we're gonna use when you're, policy, when you, when you're making policy in the sphere of genetics? So, if I would tell you before, we think about genetics, you'd say, yeah, well, genetics is about my doctor giving me medical advice about my genes. But as I tried to show you before, it goes way beyond the medical arena, way beyond that realm. 
it, it really touches on so many other issues. So is the medical model the right way to think about it? You don't, de you don't deal with those, but people that deal with the medical model usually see this. Average Joe meeting Professor Smith, and he's telling you, you got to do this and this and this and this. So it's a paternalistic, top-down interaction. My role as a patient is to follow through. Okay, so we don't like paternalism, but, and even though on the book, it's, paternalism is dead, it's not dead, it's completely out there. It's, it's just changing its form. So, and I'm making those decisions about policy making in genetics. So should we not wait for patients? I decided to be tested. Well, that would be a medical, that would be a non-medical model. I said, no, you need to be tested because it will provide you a benefit. That's using the medical model to call a shot in the make policy making in genetics, uh, for example, on the screening. We will test all individuals. So are you familiar with the vaccination, anti-vaccination movement? I'm sure you heard about that. People said autism, sorry, autism and all that stuff, by the way, completely uh, are wrong. It was a biased study. The, the, the doctor did the study, lost his license. It's, it's, it's a whole story. But not for now. The anti-vaccination movement was very strong against doing those vaccines. So the state reaction, the policy-making decision was what? How do you force people to be vaccinated? You have vaccination laws, which says school attendance. You cannot, so the answer was homeschooling. So you see when you, the policy decision was not to force, but to create a strong incentive. Most parents will have issues with doing home schooling themselves, all right? So, okay, if the price to go to school is vaccination, well, we might as well do it. If that is the logic, and you, you wanna do genetics testing on the same half forced way, or are you gonna say, actually, I'm not gonna wait for a decision because we just told the newborn screening, they didn't use that model, they did. Every newborn will be tested. So you see vaccination as opposed to newborn screening. That's a policy decision. Everybody or those who will be able to play around the rules. I'll do homeschooling. College, then it's hard to do homeschooling for college. And that's another point where you meet those vaccinations. Again, with genetics, we're going to do that or not. Stanford tried three years ago uh, to do a genetic testing for all new and release in Stanford. Send your samples to Stanford, Silicon Valley, Google, 23andMe. It's all in that area. It's, it's, it's not a surprise, all right? It's not a surprise. Everybody knows about 23andMe? Okay, so, so not surprised it came from there. Should we allow Stanford to do it? Now, again, that was a Stanford initiative. Anonymity. It's like if you're, if you're allowed 23andMe, a commercial company, why can't you allow Stanford to do that as a research So they, turned, they shut it down, of course, because public outcry was too strong for them. But again, that's, that's policy and it's institutional policy decision about that. Public health model will be the next one. So wait a second. It's not genetics. It's really not about you. It's really about us. As beautiful you are and as ugly I am, we share 99.9% .9 of our genes. We are really, if I would, if I would take Harry Potter's book, number three. What's the title of that number three? Harry Potter, number three? Uh, okay, all right. And I would take that book and I would change every, what's nine, 99.9%. So every 1,000 word, I would change that word only. All right? And I said, now it's my book. This isn't joking. It's, of course, it's the Rowling's book. So the fact that we all share the same gene, how individual my genetic makeup is, or maybe it's really a, co a collective good. When the Human Genome Project embarked, they had to make a policy decision about who owns the project, who owns the hum hum mankind or womankind gene, who owns it? Is it a property? I mean, remember, companies in the United States and elsewhere were patenting genes. How can you patent a gene if it's not really yours? Are you patenting the discovery? Are you patenting the, 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 the sequence of the gene? What's to be patented over there? 
And the decision of the Human Genome Project was with an international consortium that the human, the mankind gene, humanity's gene is a collective asset that belongs to the entire mankind, or human, human, human being. This decision was actually later on reflected in the famous Myriad Genetics case in the Supreme Court of the United States, where for the first time, the Supreme Court says, wait a second, you cannot sequence the gene and then have a patent on it because it's not yours. It belongs to everyone. You cannot have a barrier that relates to IP and royalties need to be paid because you just sequenced the gene. So that's a decision. Human genes should not be a property. Oregon, in 1996, Oregon, city of Oregon, decided that they need to have a, and that was before Gina, right? before Gina. So this, they, needed, they said we needed to have an enhanced protection on genetic research for individuals. It's my gene, my genes kind of concept, all right? My body, my genes. So they turned all genetic samples into property. You own a land, you own your uh, smart car, and you own your genes. And therefore, the minute somebody looks on your genes, that's conversion. That's intrusion to privacy, whatever. But, and they turn it to property to give it the strongest protection the American law can give. No trespass. You sitting on the, on the roof with a shotgun, no trespassing. That's it. That's the strongest protection. So they turned it. Well, Oregon had to repeal that two years later on because all startup companies just left Oregon. Could no, could, no research could have been done. So they had to change it back to the, to the medical information uh, a model as opposed to a property model, as you see in number six here. Uh, what about patients' rights? Is that the right model? Well, the same way that I consent to surgery, the same way that I give permission to participate in the research, I will control my samples, not from a property issue, but rather uh, from a right, patient rights issue, uh, perspective, sorry. And that pertains to a discussion where paternalism is replaced by a shared decision-making model. It's a joint venture, if you want, and therefore needs to be delibera delibera deliberations about the projects and where you want to take it, and uh, are their goals are acceptable, all, 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 the, all the issues we talked before, but on the focus of the patients in control. So 10 million samples that were found out in Texas that the government is using them, that cannot prevail if it's a patient rights model, because you need to have me part of your team when I make the decision. And finally, this will suit your, your, your generation, informational data model. But actually, genes can replace them with uh, four letters, and you just create an algorithm. I don't care about the, the biological sample. It's irrelevant. Give me the samples. Let's read all the letters, create the software, throw it away. I don't care about the samples at all. And now you become easier for us to look at genetic information as part of the general data holder responsibilities. Then who has access can be used, acceptable, impermissible purposes, and so on. So, so suddenly you see some genetics, when I, I'm sure well, most of you when you talk about genetics, mm, it's gonna talk about diseases. No, suddenly removing genetics in a different sphere altogether. Who owns the bytes of, the, of those information? What can they be used for? Who can protect it? Is it a national asset? Decode project. Have you heard of Decode? That's a fun project. Iceland. Far, far, cold, cold. It's not a snow. And there's a small population, 300,000 people only. And they all join in a huge national biobank project. The project was all about finding the relationship between genes, environment, and lifestyle in a very closed community. Icelanders don't mix with other nations. They have a very small immigration uh, percentage. So it's, a, it's like a perfect laboratory scenario to do those sophisticated genetic and genomics. A genomic, not just reading the letters, that's not important. Like I said, genetics and genomics, like, like again, using the Harry Potter. You can read all, you can get to kick all the book and make it one huge word. Right? You just take away all the spaces and with one huge word. Okay, so now I can read all the letters, but do you know if Hermione is upset with Harry Potter from page seven to page 21? You can't. 
That's, gen that's genomics, the, inter the interaction between the genes, how they speak with each other, what influences them, and so on and so forth. So again, going back to Decode, it's an entire community that stepped up to say, we want to create this huge database that will look at the genealogy, all the family relationship. They go back to the 11th century. In Iceland, they go back, they have those family trees all the way to 11th century. It's amazing. So you know who's married who and who's, how they're related. And then you have that, you have the genetic samples, and they tied that to the medical records and ongoing medical records. So that's, again, you have all, all those data sets, and then you can start have software to work with them. But then once you do that, well, wow, that's a huge asset. Now, who owns the asset? Decode was a private company. But actually, they were holding the entire Icelandic database, the potential of their health, to the genes. So is it a national asset now, or it's still owned by the company who did it? So the way they structured this in Iceland was that the government should have an updated copy of the, everything that Decode has. And Decode should, should allow access to the government for, pla, pla, for planning, for meeting uh, uh, threats uh, on the genetic front, changing lifestyle, the whole thing. So for policy planning, but nevertheless, Decode had its own database. And actually, Decode was later on bought by an uh, American company, huge. So now, an American company is holding the entire Icelandic database to be used. Again, there's protections, there's also all those uh, 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 firewalls in the process. But at the end of the day, this is, this is what happened. So the question who owns the database is a national asset. That's, again, a policy-making decision. Um, well, I'm running out of time here. So I'll just do uh, two, so about genetics, the research phase that I mentioned before. So we need to translate those, those, those knowledge from the research lab to clinical practice. So you have to go to research. Research involves human beings. That's difficult. Gene therapy that was hailed in the past was difficult. People had died during research protocols. So that, that was a major obstacle to the progress of that. But lately, uh, gene editing is now happening and children um, already are being treated for leukemia and other diseases. Um, I mentioned about testing for the genes in uh, and the uh, tumors. So huge promise, very, very expensive. Should we sponsor or not? So the German study says don't, American study says you should. Again, not for a discussion, just to show you that's a moving target. These are, this is two th January 9, 2017. These are, it's an, what I'm trying to show here is it's an ongoing uh, 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 movement with research and genetics. Uh, CRISPR, that's a new thing on the horizon. I'm sure you heard about that. It's the ability to really, really manipulate the genes the way you want it, a very, in a very accurate way. So now it's moving from research to the clinical research and later on to clinical practice. So in the UK, where it's very heavily regulated, it's not IRB in the institution. It's a national IRB. So somebody from the national level is scrutinizing your research. Um, like I said, the cost, the prices, we need to think about the cost. This company is charging $850,000 for one-time treatment. That's a heavy toll, guys. It's a heavy toll for everyone. Companies, individuals. So is that something we're going to regulate? Should we cap the prices? And I'm sure you're all familiar with the epinephrine scandal that took, in this, took place in this country when the company just uh, upfold, increased the price dramatically. These are issues that we discuss. You're in the right age, so we'll discuss this a bit. Spouse choosing. Are we going to use genetics to choose your spouse? Hmm. What does that mean? All right, so if you be able to characterize, when, when you go on G-Date or whatever sites you people are going today, uh, we used, I, used, I got married with a matchmaker, but this, that's a different story. But you do the internet and everything. When you, I want a um, mate that is A, B, C, D, E. You put your characteristics, that's what you're seeking, right? I love to hike. Uh, okay, now, if you put that, I love to hike and you should have strong genes for whatever. Will that be legitimate or not? So that seems, sounds a bit far-fetched, right? Well, actually it's not. So because I, 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 I anticipated your face, 
Here's a study that, a study that we did back in 2010. Uh, there's two, I'll start with the Cypriot one. Um, in Cyprus, Cyprus is endemic for thalassemia. Thalassemia, every one in four Cypriots have thalassemia. That's a disease that uh, creates uh, uh, problems with the bone marrow. And there's a treatment with it, but it's very expensive. And you need to, they need, they need to be treated with a blood transfusion, transfusion once in three weeks. And the desferada medication is very expensive. It's actually it's so, it's so prevalent there that it was draining the Cypriot uh, health budget because they have a national health system. So the World Bank and uh, other philanthropy uh, uh, funds came to Cyprus and offered them a premarital screening, which means when I get married, fine. But before I get the license, we need to show the clerk that we've both done our thalassemia testing. And it doesn't prevent you getting married, not at all. But once you know that you have the gene, then you will resort to prenatal testing. And if, God forbid, there's a problem, you might do an abortion. So that's a premarital. But that's at the late stage. Dorisharium, which comes from my community, is a fun one because what they do is they don't even start dating before each of the cup part, each partner will have his genes tested. Why? Because they want to avoid recessive diseases. And I'll explain it. This, this warrants five or two minutes explanation. In the Jewish Ashkenazi population, they're heavily afflicted with Tizax. Tizax is a lethal disease. You die by the age of four or five. Horrific, horrific death. This, it's an autosomal recessive disease. So you need both parents to carry the gene. So if both parents have the gene, they're not sick because they would have died. So they can be only recessive, can only, can only be carriers. So, but if they couple together, there's one in four for each pregnancy that child will have Tizax, which again will die. So they start with Tizax and later on they're brought to similar diseases that have autosomal recessive, severely debilitating or lethal diseases. And now they screen for 12 of those diseases. And then they go to the high school, right after high school, and every individual gives his blood test. The blood test is worked at the central lab. Individuals don't get the results. Don't. Why? Because for matchmaking, and they get married in matchmaking, you need to have complete confidentiality because you don't, you don't have those people that are tainted. No, we don't get married with those people. They have the genes. No, we don't that. So strict confidentiality is maintained. Male and female be, are tested at the age of 17 to 20, and the results are kept, like I said, in the lab. Each individual is getting a code. So when a match or date is proposed, both will call the center and give, these are my numbers, and there'll be an answer. Advisable or non-advisable? The dating itself, so there's no string attached. Here, you're gonna cancel marriage because you have the wrong genes. No, this is before you said, so not a good match, you move to the next one. Cool or what? <laughs> Complicated. <laughs> Complicated, but, and here's the thing, since the establishment of Dori Sharim, not a single Thai Zach's child was born to the world. That is the largest, most successful public health initiative in genetics ever. And you know who sponsored this project? New York Department of Public Health. They sponsored the, the, the establishment of this. The rabbis from the community came, said this is the problem we have, and they designed the solution. And now it's moving on to other things. So going back to your, your, your smile before, think about it. I'm gonna, see, go see the movie Gattaca. She, she gives him a hair. If you wanna date me, here's my hair, do the screening. Do, do screen me out. But sounds far-fetched, like I said, in the right circumstances, with the right payoffs, you might as well engage in that. Uh, I have two more minutes, so I'm gonna zoom through. Am I correct? Not two more minutes? No. So I'll just, I'll, I'll choose things that I wanted to discuss too. This is cool that I'll use this for it. Uh, but they gene based beware diet won't probably help you lose weight, so be careful about that. It's brand new, as you see, it's from February 18. Um, this, is this is really annoying. Because gene testing is so easy to get, and I don't, I don't, I'm not sure that you're aware that in urban settings, between 10 to 15 percent of children, should I say it mildly, uh, are not, uh, don't have the right dad in mind. 
All right. So if the paternity test is so accessible, then that can be so awful to those family relationships. And actually, this shows you that the paternity uh, uh, do it yourself tests are so in. And we can think about it. So we're going to leave it out there. Let the, let, let the dad find out. And then he can estrange his child. It's not mine. He can get the board. I mean, these are issues that when you have, when you understand that genetic information could be toxic, then you might want to regulate the use of that. So, for example, in Israel, paternity tests can only be done with a court order. You cannot do, do it yourself. You have to have a court order for that. Because to protect who? To protect who? To protect the child. I'm sure you heard of Ancestry.com. Well, you can get really many big, 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 big issues there. The doctor didn't have enough sperm, so he used his own to fertilize his clients. All right, so there's, there's issues, yeah. You go like this, so did I. I didn't say, well, oh. Genetics, I told you, genetics is fun. Genetics are fun. <laughs> and genetics and behavior, that's the next part when I'll just wrap up with that. If you will play with behavior and genetics, and clearly your behavior, like I said, is genetically modified at least. I mean, there's no gene for the human spirit, but some of your behaviors will be genetically uh, uh, modified or be related to your genes. And then the question is how far are we willing to go with this? And like this is an example, the monoamine oxytase gene, now I actually can tell you if you're a risk taker or not. So think about the casinos, having a list of, of clients that have this risk taking gene. They'll get them the limousine, the free suit, I can come in. Like for army, will I take a risk taker in my, as a soldier, as a, pilot, as a captain, all those issues, a doctor, as a porter, they can uh, uh, affect us. And finally, like I said, moving from, to genomics, it's not about me anymore. I told you, Keith, let's talk about me. Let's talk about I. No, no, it's not that. It's about us. It's really using those powers to influence society at large. Oh, they have issues. You can steal it, but that's another discussion. So again, which paradigm best fits rule-making and policy-making genetics? This is what you have. This is your toolbox. Toolbox, sorry. And which tool you're going to use for each scenario? That requires expertise. And to do that, you have to come to a three-day course at the law school. Guys, thank you very much. Maybe some questions go on. Yeah. Let's some questions. Um, Don't be shy. Microphone so we can catch your But there's a gene for shyness, by the way, just something. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Josh. I'm a postgraduate student here in the Batten School. Uh, I'm wondering just to hear your thoughts on uh, Gene drives and CRISPR-Cas9 and people self-experimenting and like if, you know, uh, people, not necessarily eugenics, but yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on people self-experimenting with CRISPR-Cas9 and gene drives and people doing it The question was about do-it-yourself CRISPR and accidentally just not to publish it on this topic. I'll share with I'll share with Karen you will share you will share that article. We called it Chris Moonshine. Chris the Moonshine. And the problem with that, you saw that the problem with moonshining is that since it's so easy, regulation is bound to fail. So you need to find other places in the process which will give you leverage on those individuals. Um, I we think that there's the fear from CRISPRs are partially overstated, um, but however, it has to be regulated because mainly the germline modification, which will affect from now to the end of times, that's where the issue uh, is, is really problematic. The big problem, and why am I sure it's futile if you do a very, very aggressive, it's gonna go, it's gonna go elsewhere. If you go to China, if you go to Mexico, if you go to Eastern Europe when there's no regulation at all. So what do you do then? I mean, in Israel, for example, we're very, you know, we like to do things and we'll allow ourselves more things that are used to allow in the United States. For example, stem cell research was allowed in Israel, wasn't it? So American scientists ran, came to move their research to Israel. So on an international perspective, you have to be very smart with the regulation. So moonshining is an issue with CRISPR. We're aware of it. We have to find the right leverages to stop it. Moonshining on a 
individual level is not going to have impact. It's just going to die. Okay, I did it. Great. Now what? But if you don't have your, if you're not on top of things, then it can spread over. So it's an issue. Right? Thank you for bringing that up. And you have to get that article. All right. Other question? Yes, sir. Okay, so there's, there's like out off the bat four, the question was using the genetics in the judicial system. So there's four main avenues. The first one, of course, is identification. Finding the remains, proving the, uh, the crime scene, you know, CSI, all the things, you've seen that. So that's easy. The second thing, like I said, is family issue. Paternity, inheritance, right? So who, who is your dad, who's not? It's a big, it's, it's, who's your daddy? It's not Toby Keith's son. It's, it's, it's a complicated, okay? Is, is okay, Toby Keith, or it's not okay to say this? That's okay? okay. I was in Harvard, they didn't like that at all. So just, it depends where you are. It de depends where you are, all right? Uh, uh, number three, it's not me, it's my genes. In the criminal setting, that's very tricky because if I can, you know, mitigating my sentence as well, if, you know, you come to say, well, I was a better child, okay, so you get three years instead of six years. So there's mitigating costs for your. For your, for, your, for your crime. Would genes be allowed to be a mitigating cause? The answer so far is no, a big night. No, 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 because genes are only 40% for your behavior. 60% is who you are. Life, expectant, life experience, stuff like that. 40% is the genes, so you're supposed to overcome that. However, in parole decisions, and your chances of being recidivist, that's a huge issue. John Monahan from our law school is now pushing on that. He has this crude, Questionnaire about all those factors, you know, the regression analysis of all the. I said, well, John, what about, it? what about genes? Said, oh, good idea. Now it's put into work. Will that be helpful or not? I think it should be, especially in recidivism, because if not, lock him in forever. Don't put him for all, because he's going to redo it for sure. We know that. So there's, that could be something that's worth exploring. Bravo. Bravo. So here's, here's the question. So you, you go to Disney and you lose your ticket. No problem, because they scan, they, they scan your fingerprints. You know that in Disney, when you go in and out. You don't need a ticket anymore. When I was there last time, that's what they did. Put your finger, you go in and out. So, or Disney-like, doesn't matter. I'm building propaganda here. So you scan. Now assume there was, a, there was a murder in the vicinity of that park. Can the police go and screen all those fingerprints and then find match fingerprints with a picture of the guy and then find the perpetrator? It's a big deal, it's a big deal. Those databases are supposedly secured from police search and seizure, supposedly. It depends where country you are. In England, they have the UK Biobank, 600,000 people are on file. And, then, and when you enroll, they say, we will do everything we can to protect your privacy. However, a court order might force us to allow access to those things. Now, your question should be, and by the way, you can do that not just for individuals, you can do family searches. Because if you have find somebody that is close enough to what you need, then he becomes your proxy and you go around circles and you find and you go that, and then you can do a dragnet and search and find other family members. So even I'm, if I was the murderer and my uncle went to Disney, genetic Disney, we have samples of his, his, his data, in the data, database, they can find me at the end of the day. So the question is, is it okay to have everybody on file for police purposes. In the world of biometric, passports today are biometric. In the world of Facebook, everything is out there exposed. There's a lot of thinking about, right now, we have an uneven burden. Because only, because you know, every country in the world, if you have created a crime, you will be in the database. So CODIS, that is the combined index of criminal offenders that's shared by the FBI, 50, all 50 states have that access to that database. Again, the decision, of course, are we going to share or not? They share it now. But right now, only perpetrators are inside. What about those who were suspects in England? They get the suspects inside the database as well. 
So naturally, they're getting more and more suspects. Oh, you're a suspect, and they, uh, and they increase. Right now, there's, let's say, 50% of the population is in the forensic, in the, in the criminal database. Is it fair? Is it not fair? So people are saying, stop this. Use the newborn screening. Everybody's there. Put them in the database, and end of story. Because right now, you're waiting in line to make that database possible. In mind, what do you have in mind? Let's prevent crime. If you know you're on fine, you will be fine. You leaving your, your hair or semen in the sink, you might think twice before you take that. There it is. For myself, personally, uh, there's a lot of narrative and methods right now. It's an unseen thing. Where two people are married or in the car or whether or not. And, it's, and I think about the next person. You know. Think about it. If you have now, student was raped in childhood, and all students are in the medical center database. The next sin, and also all childhood in, 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 population in the medical, in the UBA health system. And you know that that guy is going to do it again. Try to prevent that or not. That's a clear point. Yeah, okay, so kind of go along the thought. I know that it's 2023, and we think that our moms are selling the security of the other moms. Would you just like comment on some of those? So when 23 and me started, no one understood the business model. They had, they were doing it for $99. Then the country was clearly the processing of that was much more. They, wouldn't, they couldn't make any money, but eventually turned out that they were just assembling those samples to create the largest biobank in the world. And right now, they allow pharma companies to go through their samples and find pure research. Now, am I exposed as a 23 new plant? Probably not. Am I, is my DNA serving a good purpose? Probably is. The question is, why weren't they transparent about the first place? Transparency does end, end, end up with this. Especially with genetics. But it calls for every, it's going to hit you in every front of leadership and policy making. If you're not transparent, it's going to hit you that strong. You have, if you don't know where you're going, say, I don't know, at this time. But if you know where you're going, and you have a clear vision, share that vision, and, and that will allow individuals to opt in or opt out of that. Like not to be me, took away that from you. Is it going to serve the human kind? Yes. Is it going to serve alpha stock or the twenty-three stock trade level? Of course. It's mixed. We feel uneasy because we're cheated. If that's the case. Okay, guys. Thank you very much again. Yeah.